All right, Philadelphia Eagles are up on the clock. Speaking of uh, A-pluses. <sighs> They start with a couple Georgia guys. Jalen Carter at number nine, the defensive tackle. They, he falls to nine, and the, the Eagles trade up from 10 to nine to secure him. They let Nolan Smith, the edge, edge defender out of Georgia, fall to them at pick 30. They go Tyler Steen, tackle slash guard out of Alabama in round three. They had another, and then the back-to-back -back picks there. Second pick there was safety Sidney Brown out of Illinois. Go back to Georgia with Keely Ringo. In the fourth round. In the fourth round, a cornerback who people thought could go in the first. They get the great Tanner McKee, round six, pick 88, quarterback out of Stanford, and then Moro Ojomo, the defensive tackle out of Texas. I thought he was more of a third or fourth round player, and he goes all the way in round seven. So, look, our process, right or wrong, when players go lower than expected and you draft all of them, that feels good Yeah, coming out of draft day and when we put the draft grades together. That's what the Eagles feel like right here. They got a bunch of players lower than expected. Yeah, and it is, this is where um, there isn't evidence to say that that's good, right? There, there is evidence to say if you reach relative to the consensus board, that's bad. Generally speaking, trying to be smarter than the board is, is a bad thing. There is not evidence to say, however, that if you go in the reverse, if you, gra if you consistently grab guys that are falling um, and essentially you're like, oh, look, we got great value. These guys are ranked higher on the consensus board. There's not evidence to say that that consistently works out better than just drafting whoever the consensus says. Uh, essentially, I think the logic is that if a guy's falling, it's probably for a reason, um, and it's a reason that the consensus board doesn't have access to, you know, injuries a lot of the time. So there will be injuries or off-field or whatever it is, character. There will be a bunch of reasons that are legitimate for a guy to fall that the consensus uh, rankers never have access to. The question, in, the question would be, though, does that taint that data or that analysis, that conclusion? Like, if a guy is falling for reasons that aren't clearly explained by a medical red flag or, like, a character concern we don't know about or whatever it is, like, something legitimate that means you would rank him higher based off the tape than you would if you knew all this stuff, is that actually swaying the analysis to say, well, if a guy's just falling and there isn't an explanation for that, you do get good value by, by stopping that fall and grabbing that guy. That, I think, is probably a little bit up in the air. But you look at Philadelphia's haul. I mean, the Jalen Carter thing, we lost a bet off the back of that, our, uh, our podcast bets. Our final tally, by the way, we won 28 of them. We lost nine of them, I think. Uh, from the ones we accepted. Do we want to go through those maybe on Friday? They could be Friday. Maybe, show? and we'll, draft we'll fire out the emails and the free PFF Plus subscription to all those people eventually. But the, the Jalen Carter one was one we lost because somebody said somehow how he's going to work his magic and the Eagles are coming, going to come out of this draft with Jalen Carter. And this was back when, you know, everyone's like, he's going five, he's going six, he's not making it out of the top ten. And he didn't. He started to slide, and the Eagles went, we'll jump up one spot and we'll grab Jalen Carter, who is arguably the most talented player in this entire draft. And a couple of things. Number one, gets to go to a defensive rotation that's not going to need him to play a ton of extra snaps. You know, One of the concerns or question marks about him and anybody coming out of that Georgia defense is they rotate so heavily up front, they only play 350 snaps in a year. What happens if you ask him to play 700? Do, do you get the same thing? Uh, well, he doesn't need to. Like, the Eagles rotate as well. He doesn't need to play more than 350 snaps in a year. And number two, he goes to a defense that is already stuffed full of Georgia defensive players and, and leaders in that team. Like, N'Kobe Dean was the leader on that defense in, in 2021. He's now their starting linebacker in Philadelphia. They already had Jordan Davis. He's been there for a year. They bring in Nolan Smith uh, around – or uh, – a bunch of picks later, they bring in Keely Ringo a bunch of picks later. Like, they are assembling guys that he already knows that might have some kind of influence in terms of keeping him together and on the straight and narrow and whatever and avoiding any potential maturity concerns that other teams might have had. So, man, Jalen Carter going to Philadelphia, insane. Then, then sitting there at 30 and having Nolan Smith drop into their laps, also insane. Yeah, that was one of the more common questions for Howie Roseman. Uh, Nick Sirianni at their press conference was, you know, how how nice is it to have him with four, a bunch of former Georgia Bulldogs? It's like, yeah, of course you'd want to be in a new job with uh, friends, with friends from college. Who wouldn't, you know, who else wouldn't help? Uh, who wouldn't that help, you know, as far as transitioning to, to the NFL? Um, Nolan Smith, I thought he could have gone top 15, you know, very good pass rusher, 238 pounds, still powerful in the run game. And look, this is the Eagles 
staying true to form, right? Because they don't have a defense. It's not just a defensive line rotation. It's a team that builds through the offensive and defensive line. They're always good in those areas. And the two Bulldogs, Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter, get to sit there right next to Fletcher Cox. Yeah. As he you know rides off into the sunset probably in his career for the Eagles, learn from Fletcher Cox. Nolan Smith gets to be right next to Hassan Reddick. You've made that point a, a ton, right? Similar body type, similar player. So the Eagles, it's not a, it's not a cheat code, but it's like they, they were equipped to take both of these players, right? Mm-hmm. It, it is a very good fit, and they did a really nice job of – just letting it come to them. They did trade up one spot to go get Jalen Carter, but also how are the Eagles? I got to look back at uh, how they got to the spot. I, I did like a very loose. Well, this is why recap like a couple there's days so ago. much value sometimes in playing that game of trading into the future and picking up future first round picks and all that kind of stuff because the Eagles, who were a couple of plays away from winning the Super Bowl, have just come out of this draft with arguably the best player from it. That's, that should not be possible. Like The entire structure is literally set up to prevent that happening. It's like, no, the, the rich shouldn't get richer. We make the worst teams get the best players. That's how the whole draft is set up to work. And yet Philadelphia is able to come out of this draft with Jalen Carter, who is arguably the best player, because they played this game of you know trading some picks into the future, getting an extra future first rounder, and now they were picking in the top ten anyway when they were – you know, the best team in the NFC. They earned that, though. I mean, the, the, so the, I want to go back really quick just to recap kind of how we got here. By the way, there's also some quote. Was it uh, Florio that posted it that executives are, or maybe it was Schrager, executives around the league are, you know, getting a little upset at all the credit Howie Roseman's getting. I mean, stop giving him the opportunity to make good things happen. Then. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, this, I, I'm going to really paraphrase the the work that got them here because there's other picks and there's other stuff in there, but... Basically, when they tanked week 17 yeah. in 2020, that moved them up six spots in the draft, which started a, a chain reaction of events. The contrast Plus, is just mind-blowing. you got two teams that had the Eagles pull their start, literally pull their starters in a game they were, gonna, they were potentially winning to lose a game deliberately and move up in the draft and start this whole thing going. And then on the other hand, you have Houston, who – what was it, a, like a, essentially a Hail Mary attempt to win the game and a two-point conversion to win it, to steal a win that took them away from what sounded like the one quarterback that they really wanted and put them in the number two spot. Like, the difference in those two things is ridiculous. It is amazing how much impact that has. Um, but I, oversimplified here, the Eagles turned that Week 17 loss from 2020 and then Carson Wentz, who they were going to already move on from, Turn those guys into A.J. Brown, Jordan Davis, and Jalen Carter. Now, I, I don't know how good Jordan Davis is going to be. I feel much better about Jalen Carter becoming a star in this league as long as everything checks out. They may have found two stars there. A.J. Brown, I think, has as big of an impact as any player in the NFL last year going to a new team. And, again, it's oversimplified. But the people that are criticizing Howie, you could say, hey, you know what? Howie Roseman drafted Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson. Yeah. What an idiot, right? But that is literally every single evaluator. That mm-hmm. is. What the Eagles have done well is the process part of it. Last year before the draft, maneuvering picks with the Saints. The Saints got the extra pick last year, so the Eagles could have the first-round pick this year. That's how they got pick number nine, is because last year they said, we're going to keep pushing to the future, pushing to the future. But they still had enough picks last year to trade for A.J. Brown in the first round. So accumulate all these assets, maneuver them around, and you're going to win over time. It's the process that the Eagles are winning, not so much the player selection. It's the process that they're winning to put themselves in position so they can let Jalen Carter fall to them, so they can let Nolan Smith fall to them. And even the process, like when they get it wrong, the process is usually sound. Like drafting Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson was obviously a mistake, but bringing in a first-round wide receiver at that point was a, a good thing. It was a necessity. It was a thing they needed to do. They didn't get it done. They weren't gun-shy the next year. They went back and got Devontae Smith at the top of the draft, and Devontae Smith has become a good player, but even after year one, it's like, is he going to become the superstar? Not really sure. All right, fine. Let's send a first-round pick to Tennessee, and let's get A.J. Brown, who was already a superstar, and that makes everything better. So they – they didn't like get spooked by goofing one time in a first round pick. They doubled down and then tripled down over the next two years. And that's why all of now they have this amazing 
you, receiving group. You could say, though, too, the Jalen Hurts pick was actually the first thing that set everything into motion because he was a process pick. Like, let's just get this backup quarterback with starting potential in round two. And that allowed them to eventually trade Carson Wentz, which became a first-round pick and put a lot of this stuff into motion, too. So I think it's the process, not so much. I, I love the Eagles' actual picks. It is their multiple-year process that they have implemented and stuck with that I think has put them into such a great position. Yeah, they also absolutely. had a point in the draft where they took two sevens and flipped it for a five next year. Yeah, they they flipped two sevens for a five for next year. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you have the ability to do that. The um, Keely Ringo pick is is a fascinating one as well. So that was at the top of the draft. They traded a th they traded a third round pick next year to get Keely Ringo this year. Um, and he had, he was a guy who pretty high in the fourth too. So I mean, that's only like it's probably only ten to fifteen picks. Yes, right of difference. Um, Keely Ringo, thirty eight overall on the consensus board, ends up getting picked by Philadelphia, pick one hundred five by the time they traded up for that. And the okay, Ringo's got some problems to his game, which is why he slipped that far. Like he's got some real stiffness, lateral movement, change of direction isn't necessarily great. But at six two. 207 pounds with speed you don't generally see players that have that kind of build slip that far um particularly when you consider how old he is and the the comedy stat that that was thrown out there over the weekend is that by the time keel ringo has finished his rookie career his rookie contract he will still be younger than hendon hooker is right now like that's wow he's seriously young with a six foot two 207 pound frame i mean this is the stuff of dreams from a cornerback uh, scenario okay, the change of direction stuff is concerning, but they can now bring him in behind those two like legitimate superstar starters that they have, Darius Slay, James Bradbury, and kind of work out what he can be long-term and maybe coach him up and maybe get him better at that kind of stuff. Like That's a great process pick. I, I think it was too. Ringo at that point. The other pick that I just want to highlight really quick, uh, so Ajomo in the, in the seventh. Again, I thought he was a guy that could rush from the interior, play the run, rush from edge as a, as a change of pace. So I think he could be good value in the seventh. I don't know if he'll fit into this rotation, but really, really productive player. I don't know why he went that low. I don't think it's just because he's a tweener body. Those guys, they, the NFL's figured out how to yeah. value those guys at least by round four. And then the other player was Sidney Brown, the safety out of Illinois. The grades weren't always great. He missed a ton of tackles. But listening to, um, I know Trevor loved him. The, the Howie Roseman talked about him. They, uh, they call him a red star player. They have scouts go through and put like red stars across like eight or ten players every single draft that they just love and want to go to bat for. He was one of those guys for them. And he was really a box safety who just flies around, headhunter, uh, misses a ton of tackles, but makes a lot of explosive plays. But they were citing his ability to play free safety at the Senior Bowl and at least see that different look that said, hey, maybe he can – be a more versatile safety. It's what the Eagles need. He's got a chance to compete for playing time right away because Reed Blankenship and Kayvon Wallace are competing at free safety or at least in one of the safety spots opposite Terrell Edmonds. So Sidney Brown has a chance to be a starter. I think he's got to clean up a lot of his game, but he is that like firecracker, fly around the field type of player that so many coaches love. And I'm interested because the production data is different from that scouting data, but at safety, it could work. So they may have had another. They may have added another starter with pick sixty six in round three. Yeah, in Sidney Brown. So we're going a plus for the Eagles. I think it's. Uh, I think a lot of people are probably going to land somewhat close to uh, to that conclusion. Execs being like butthurt over Howie Roseman getting a ton of credit. By the way, is one of the most pathetic things I've ever heard. I mean, you can't look at what he's done over the last several years and think that he's not deserving of praise. Like he's done. He's done an incredible job i mean okay everybody has misses everybody also has random hits out of nowhere but generally from start to finish the process in building this whole thing has been pretty much flawless they've played this game to perfection they haven't always just gambled the way some teams have and gone well if this works we're great if it doesn't work we're we stink they've hedged like, they didn't commit to Jalen Hurts as the starter right away. They specifically played the game of let's trade for future first-round picks so that if he doesn't get any better, we can pivot and go get a quarterback at the top of the draft. Like They have played this thing masterfully. He deserves the credit.